Hey guys, so I just wanted to let you know before we start this video that there will be spoilers for Batman Arkham Knight. If you'd like, I'll have a link to my previous Arkham Knight video in the description. I highly suggest you watch that before you watch this video. I'd also like to give a shout out to our gold tier patrons, A Beat, Ghostly Gaming, Hutch Puppy, Lucas, and Pyrite. Thanks so much guys, and if you want to see these videos up to three days early, you can check out my Patreon in the description below. Thanks so much and enjoy the video. Batman Arkham Knight had kind of a rocky release. Don't get me wrong, it was a really good game and a lot of you seem to agree with that, but a lot of you also noted that there were some glaring issues. To give a quick reminder, those issues were too much Batmobile, lame boss fights, and a lot of side missions that just felt Eh. But the point of a DLC is to expand and improve upon a product, and while I don't think one piece of Arkham Knight's DLC really changes that, I think the Season Pass does accomplish that goal. I also think the Season Pass for Arkham Knight is exceptional for not only the amount of quality content you get, but the price at which you can get it. Something a lot of you mentioned in the Arkham Knight video and the infamous First Light video is the idea of paid DLC being something that should have been there from the start. My personal opinion is that DLC isn't inherently a bad thing. I understand why you might think DLC is something that should have been there from from the start on a game, and this is true for some DLC. Having Goro locked behind a $5 paywall is of course not okay because he was on the disc. In the case of Batman, the DLC isn't something that was ready to go from the gate, aside from the two pre-order missions and some pre-order skins. Regardless, the DLC is not integral to the experience of Arkham Knight. There are no new story segments, endings, or any radical gameplay changes. It's just more of what you got in Arkham Knight. So for me, I don't mind paying for more of what I enjoyed. So if you feel like it's milking the consumer, I totally get that but for me, I don't see an issue with it, because for a good price, the Season Pass gets you quite a lot of new content. Now, I know that Season Pass isn't technically a DLC, as it's more of a series of DLC, and you guys even mentioned in the infamous First Light video that First Light isn't really a DLC because it's a standalone download. In my opinion, I think DLC can apply to any sort of expansion for a game, so something like a standalone expansion, i.e. First Light, would fall into my own personal definition. Anywho, let's talk about that and let's get into what this Season Pass includes. You get the Red Hood Story Pack, Harley Quinn Story Story Pack, Batgirl, A Matter of Family, Nightwing, GCPD Lockdown, Catwoman's Revenge, Robin, Flip of a Coin, Season of Infamy, and what feels like hundreds of new challenge maps and skins for your favorite characters. To give you an idea of the value of this DLC, let's look at how much value you get out of the main game. It should take you around 17 hours to complete Arkham Knight. I'm not including the amount of time it takes to get all the Riddler trophies, as judging by the comments on the Arkham Knight video, a lot of you did everything but the Riddler trophies. I'm assuming that the average player would at least complete all the side missions and try every challenge map at least once. Of course, your mileage may vary as I found myself losing more time to the challenge mode than I thought I would. And since the game is $25 Canadian, that means that you pay about $1.50 per hour of content. The DLC adds about 8 hours of gameplay, again, assuming you played all the new Arkham episodes and tried all the new challenge maps at least once. Now the Season Pass goes for about $25 if you already have the game, but if you purchase the Season Pass bundled with the game, it works out to only about $15. Meaning that you're paying about $3 per hour of content or $1.80 per hour of content. Now, of course, it's about the quality of the content, not the length, but I can personally say that the content in this DLC is on par with everything else in Arkham Knight. And if you don't like the Batmobile, then I'd say its quality is even greater. Firstly, let's begin with the Red Hood and Harley Quinn Story Pack. I'm going to talk about them in tandem because they follow the same formula and are about the same length. They were pre-order bonuses and they are quite short, clocking in at about half an hour for the both of them, assuming you don't die along the way. Because they were developed alongside the main game, a lot of criticisms against Arkham Knight are unfortunately unanswered here. Fortunately, that does not not apply to the other pieces of content, which we will get into later. Harley Quinn's story sees you running through Bloodhaven, a location briefly mentioned in Arkham Knight. In here, you run through a police station beating up cops, and you free poison Ivy while also dealing with Nightwing. Playing as Harley was fun, because she controls very similarly to Batman when it comes to combat, however, her animations are altered drastically. She beats people down with her baseball bat, breaks backs, and pummels faces with her legs, which have a polygon count in the millions. Harley does share some animations with other established characters like Catwoman, but despite this, I feel she has enough new animations to make her feel unique. Harley does have a new ability exclusive to her character, that being her mayhem mode. When you're taking down the fuzz, if you were to fill up your mirror, you can enter a mode which applies a menacing filter to the screen and an even more menacing buff to your attacks, allowing them to instantly take down any enemy. I must admit that this didn't change much with combat, as there was no strategy to filling the mayhem meter, and when you activate it, it just turns into mashing square. I will admit that playing as Harley was really fun though because of her exaggerated animations, and if we're being honest, because the combat was so good and so well refined, I could play this game 
same as a cardboard box and still have a lot of fun. While Harley may not feel different in the combat department, she most certainly commands a different playstyle in the stealth department. Harley, due to her callow combat experience and due to her overall madness, doesn't quite know how to stay quiet. Every takedown you perform will be loud and this changes the way I approach stealth scenarios as her. As a Cape Crusader, I preferred to take a ghost-like approach and I would often just let myself get killed if I were spotted. I enjoyed taking down a room quietly while the guards were none the wiser. As Harley, however, you're forced to take a very quick and aggressive approach to stealth. I enjoyed this as it forced me to think on my feet more. Since Harley can't grapple up to vantage points very quickly, or at least not as quickly as Batman, you have to think on your toes a bit more and think on the fly. Also, before anyone mentions it, I know that Harley is shown here jumping across what looks like 30 feet, and yes, it's ridiculous as Harley doesn't have any cannon superpowers, but I think it's okay because the feats of strength and agility she performs are purely for gameplay sake, and don't affect the story. Because of that, I think it's fine in my books. She also has the ability to enrage some of Ivy's plants that are lying around, causing them to gobble up the enemies on the field. Here, agility and strength aren't the only tools at your disposal, she also has a few gadgets up her sleeves. Her pseudo-detective vision psychosis mode works like it does with Batman, but it has a Harley spin on it, as the walls are covered in psychotic writings and the screen has a maddening red tint. As far as gadgets go, she has a neat jack-in-the-box bomb, which functions similarly to the explosive gel, except the explosion presented here is much deadlier and the jack-in-the-box plays a song which lures enemies in. Her version of the smoke pellet is the laughing gas, which functions the same during stealth as it can cause anyone in the immediate area to start uncontrollably laughing, leading to an easy escape for the crazed psychologist. She has a snare trap too, but I didn't find much use for it, other than throwing them at charging enemies. Switching to the Red Hood DLC, we take the role of Jason Todd as he infiltrates what I believe is a branch of Psyonis Industries to track down Black Mask. I might be a little brain dead, but I was almost positive that this DLC took place before the events of Arkham Knight, but in fact it takes place afterwards. As far as the story is concerned, Jason is planning on protecting Gotham in a way Batman never could, by putting criminals away for good. Playing as Jason is a spectacular experience as he fights with the same speed and brutality as Batman, but he has a few bullet-shaped tricks up his sleeves. His guns are awesome, and the way he blows a hole in someone's head with a little friendliness palette looks so satisfying. I still find it to be quite jarring to see Jason kill someone, as he plays so similarly to Batman. Of course, that is because he shares some animations with our titular Dark Knight, but much like Harley, there are plenty of original animations which make him different from other characters. He of course incorporates his guns into a majority of his basic attacks and counters, making ample use of pistol whips and flying kicks. His guns can be used to shoot enemies charging at him, and they fatally wound whatever enemy is in the crossfire. I like that using his guns is an a cheese method, as enemies can still hit you when you're using them. His special takedowns always look so brutal, and I've really enjoyed playing as Jason, especially since they give you his Arkham Knight skin, which is just spectacular. Harley also has an alternate costume, which is just sweat-inducing, I mean, <laughs> Jason also uses a flashbang to stun enemies, and it functions similarly to the smoke pellet in stealth. He also has a zip kick, which sees him launching himself towards an enemy, and he has a grappling hook, which functions like it does with every other Batman-related character. Stealth with Jason can be a trickier ordeal. Not having Bruce's trusty cape made encounters a little tougher than I was expecting, and it made me appreciate the cape so much more. He has some silent takedowns, or at least as silent as the sound of a crunch neck can be, and his takedowns are brutal, but I didn't find much use in his gadgets when it came to stealth. I wish I had more to say, but the stealth is quite similar to the other characters. Characters. Imagine it's Nightwing, but deadlier. I haven't mentioned the boss fights or the general plot significance of these two DLCs because they are quite similar in that they kinda sucked. Both boss fights see you tackling a boss who has a large health bar, and that's about it. There's no complexity to it. They do throw a few enemies around you to help get your combo up, but you ultimately beat down the boss until their health bar hits zero. Again, I think they missed a huge opportunity to have a great boss fight against either Nightwing for Harley and Black Mask for Jason. Why not for the Nightwing one, for example, have a boss fight that sees you taking advantage of Ivy's plants. Nightwing should be treated like a real tough enemy that has to be taken down in a complex way. You could have a tactic in which you need to get Nightwing's electric batons out of his hands by jumping behind him, because with the batons he can't counter his attacks or get any attacks in. Once he gets hit from behind, he could drop his batons and temporarily switch to using his fists, which would allow you to counter him. When you do counter him, you do a little damage, but if you take advantage of the counter throw mechanic, you could throw him into one of Ivy's plants, which does much more damage. As far as plot significant goes, the Harley pack only gives extra content content that isn't really needed. The Red Hood pack did feel a little more significant as it did give us an idea of what Jason is up to. The only major downside with this DLC, and this is a criticism that will come up a lot, is the overall length. They're so short that they don't really get a chance to go anywhere gameplay-wise or story-wise. I wanted more combat and stealth scenarios with Harley and Red Hood, and especially more story-related content with Jason. I wanted to see more of what he's been up to and what his connections are. Is he in contact with the rest of the Bat family? How do they feel about him? Is he being hunted? 
I don't know. Now, the reason why I decided to start this video with these two DLCs is because they were the first ones released, and more importantly, because they were created before the release of Arkham Knight, and didn't really have the chance to improve on the issues of Arkham Knight. I feel like a major role of a DLC is to supplement and improve the base game, and I believe that the DLCs that came after this achieved this goal. These two, however, despite being just as fun and enjoyable as the main game, still suffer from the same issues of the main game. Next up is a matter of family. This one is a goodie, let me tell ya. Being the first DLC released post-launch, it had a lot on its shoulders, and while creating a prequel story wasn't my personal preference for a story given the ambiguous ending of Arkham Knight, I think this DLC, much like Infamous First Light, does a good job of expanding upon a side character. I could easily see a full-fledged game surrounding Batgirl, much like how I could see a full-fledged game surrounding Fetch. Regardless, despite this DLC being shorter, it is quite sweet. The DLC sees you in the role of Batgirl, long before the events of the Arkham games. The Joker has taken over an amusement park and has multiple people held hostage. Commissioner Gordon is amongst those hostages, and Joker explains that if Batman shows up, he'll kill Gordon. This is the reason why we don't really hear from Batman at all during the DLC, but we do team up with Robin for a majority of the set pieces. The amusement park is an awe-inducing setting as you see merry-go-rounds, ferris wheels, roller coasters, and some bright lights. These lights, however, don't stop you from sticking to the shadows, as the insides of the park, much like the outside, have a vast amount of detail. It's clear that with this DLC and pretty much all the other ones, there were no cut corners in the presentation department. Just this opening cutscene here alone is so bad as I never skipped it on multiple playthroughs. Batgirl plays much similarly to Batman, which makes sense as she was trained by him. However, she does have some of her own quirks. Her agility is much greater than the Dark Knight's, but she lacks the brute strength due to her nimble stature and her overall size. She uses her weight to take down the thugs which are much taller and larger than her. I like that they changed her animations, as she feels like a great alternative to Batman. Batgirl, due to her expert technological background, can do much more with her remote hacking device than Batman can. Unfortunately, that's the only difference from her compared to Batman. She has the same ability as him during both stealth and combat scenarios, and because of that, I won't talk much about it. The set pieces for these scenarios are spectacular as they all have an interesting backdrop to look at while breaking noses and definitely not killing anyone. I like that there are some quick thinking scenarios, such as when some hostages are trapped inside a tank that is filling with water. You have to take down a seemingly endless amount of thugs before the water fills. After taking down the thugs, you have to break the glass to get the hostages out, but you can't break it with your fists. You in fact need to break the glass with the explosive gel. I like this because the game never shows any hints as to how you could break the glass, and you have to figure it out on your own. Granted, it took all of two seconds for me to figure out, and this is the only time I remember seeing this. So I wish there were more puzzles like this where you had pressure and had to use your tools on your feet. My only major gripe was the boss battle. The boss battle for this DLC is against Harley Quinn and Joker. Imagine the boss fights from the Harley Quinn and Red Hood story pack, but now times two. There's an interesting dynamic where you have to be ready for the Joker to help out Harley and vice versa, but the fight was nowhere near challenging or really all that special. Certainly entertaining though. As as far as the story goes, well, it doesn't. Sure, there is a story, but the DLC only clocks in at 45 minutes, assuming you don't die, and so the story is brutally simplistic, but I think it was best this way. The DLC ends up being the short and sweet glimpse into the time when Batgirl was on the scene. I think the DLC didn't do much to expand upon the world or gameplay of Arkham Knight, but it did give us more of the perfected stealth and free flow combat we loved from Arkham Knight. Let's move on to the next DLC in the lineup, Nightwing GCPD Lockdown. This one is pretty basic and bare bones. The story is a little complex on this side, so let's discuss it first. After the events of Arkham Knight, the Penguin is attempting to escape GCPD by having his goons raid the place. Nightwing proceeds to stop him. Yep, that's about it. Don't get me wrong, it explains how the Bat family reacted to Bruce's disappearance, but other than that, it's fairly by the numbers. Playing as Nightwing isn't anything new, as you got to control him for a brief period in Arkham Knight during the Gunrunner side quest, but I will admit that the dialogue in this DLC is pretty funny. Someone talk to me! What's going on? Uh, sorry boss, we're not getting you out of there anytime soon. Why the bloody hell not? Cause we just got our asses kicked! Hang on, who's it? Oh no. Hey, boss! We're getting you out! You are? Where's Nightwing? Oh, he's right here. We thought you'd want to say hello. Oh, I do. <laughs> ah, sod off. After that, we have Catwoman's Revenge. This is my least favorite of the DLCs. As far as story goes, it's pretty well explained in the title. Catwoman has to break into Riddler's hideout and destroy his robotic operation. Like the Nightwing DLC, playing as Catwoman isn't really new as you got to play as her during the Riddler's Revenge side mission in Arkham Knight. I enjoyed that the DLC starts off with the objective of collecting three key cards from specific guards in order to breach Riddler's security. If you get caught, it's an instant fail, which spiced up the normal stealth and made me think about my movements much more. Once you collect the key cards, you can start taking 
taking out the guards, and once that's done, you have to solve a decently tricky puzzle to get in. Once inside, you find some robots and eventually make it to the elevator that takes you to the Riddler's computer. Now, you may be wondering why this one is my least favorite. I mean, it seems like you just get more of the stuff you love. Well, this next section here is... <laughs> oh boy. I have a bone to pick with this. When fighting a metric ass load of robots, the floor panels around you become electrified. This, as you might think, eats your health bar if you step on them. The issue I have is that the combat is not precise enough to make this environmental obstacle work. You obviously want to take out the robots as fast as possible since once the squares close in, you have barely any room to move. The issue is that when countering an enemy, you might perform an animation where you tackle the robot so you just so happen to tackle them into the electrified panel. Not only does this damage you heavily, but it also breaks your combo. The same applies to when you use a special takedown. I was stuck on this part for like 30 minutes. It was easily the most annoying part of the entirety of the Batman Arkham series and the entire encounter is based on hoping to God you get a basic counter instead of one that throws you into the electricity. God, I hate it, man. Anyways, let's just talk about the next one, okay? You know, the Catwoman DLC is decent. This one part sucks so much ass, but that's fine. The final story pack is all about Robin tracking down Two-Face while on his honeymoon with his now wife, Barbara Gordon. It seems like Robin has taken up the role of Batman and through some dialogue we see he is struggling in a way to fill the Dark Knight's large boots. How's it going? Slow. Tim, stop that. You're not him. So everyone keeps telling me. Good. I'm glad you're not. You can be better. I know it. I enjoyed this DLC quite a lot as the factory you're in serves as a really complex stealth section and when transitioning to the next area we come across this. Now I really enjoyed this as it's the best example of stealth being much like a puzzle. I had to patiently wait for all the pieces to line up and I had to detonate the explosive gel on the brute, disable one of the turrets, make sure I do a fear takedown on the two enemies while staying out of the way of the other two active turrets and while it took a few tries, finally nailing it was so awesome. These DLC episodes while not revolutionizing gameplay did give us more of the borderline perfected gameplay in Arkham Knight. It's perfect for those who didn't like the Batmobile as it's nowhere to be seen in these episodes. I think while the stories are usually bare bones, the lack of a complex story is a choice I respect. To me it felt like Rocksteady wanted to give us some pure Bat Family action, and these episodes did exactly that. The new characters do control generally the same to Batman offering a sense of familiarity, however they all have their own quirks which allow them to feel unique and give you a reason to pick them over Batman. Now these are just the different story packs that the Season Pass offers, but it also offers a few extra side missions for the main campaign under the name Season of Infamy. These side quests star the Mad Hatter, League of Shadows, Killer Croc, and Mr. Freeze, and they are all really good. The Mad Hatter mission sees you looking around Gotham for police cars that are strapped with bombs. They also have police officers in the trunk. Once rescuing the hostages with a hacking minigame, we get sent into this hypnotized state where we're transported into a storybook. This pop-up book briefly recounts the events of Arkham Asylum, City, and Night, and each game is reflected through the pop-up environments and the enemies that show up. The level design and structure was enjoyable for me as it's one of the few supernatural segments the game has to offer. Also, being able to see the individual hairs on the Mad Hatter's face is a borderline disgusting amount of detail, but damn, it does look good. The League of Shadows side quest sees you discovering that the League of Shadows are still in Gotham, and that Ra's al Ghul is on death's door due to the Lazarus Pit being destroyed during the events of Arkham City. I'd also like to quickly mention to the one guy who left a comment about it, I know it's Ra's al Ghul and not Ra's al Ghul, but who cares, man? Anyways, I like the side quest as it gave you decisions that actually seem to have some ramifications. You can choose to either destroy a new Lazarus pit, essentially leaving Ra's al Ghul to die, or inject him again. I personally chose to destroy the Lazarus pit as it doesn't feel like killing to me. The guy lived multiple lifetimes and if we do inject him, he could become even more corrupted. The mission gameplay wise was quite fun too. This is a mission that was clearly made to address the criticisms of the main game. As the story was really interesting, they added new gameplay elements and mix-ups, and there's about 15 seconds of Batmobile tops. The the mission starts off with you trailing a ninja that is bleeding out, and I like that on my second playthrough I already knew where to go and didn't have to follow the trail. I just ripped up to the hospital and went on my way. When it came to the combat, certain enemies would perform a beatdown on you, meaning you had to counter each attack. I found this little mix-up to be quite fun gameplay-wise, especially on the harder difficulties. There were a few puzzle-solving activities littered throughout the quest, and ultimately it left a really good impression on me. Next up is the side mission surrounding Killer Croc. Now, this mission is definitely one of the more basic ones gameplay-wise, but I really enjoy 
enjoy Killer Croc as a character, so it ended up being one of my favorites. An airship prison has crashed in Gotham, so we team up with Nightwing to go investigate. Upon entering, we find Killer Croc looking much larger and uglier than when we saw him in Arkham Asylum City and especially Origins. It's implied in this DLC that Croc is becoming more and more monstrous because he's mutating, which seems to happen whenever he suffers extreme trauma. This side mission does a great job of making us sympathize with Croc. Sure, the guy eats people, but we find out that the Warden was doing multiple grueling tests on Croc, leading him to becoming more and more deformed. So when I see Croc strapping up the Warden, I don't necessarily blame the guys. I would do the same to whoever was giving me drugs and using me as a guinea pig against my will. Finally, there's a side quest surrounding Mr. Freeze. We find him on a crash boat where we see that his wife Nora has gone missing. Nora's been a character that we've rescued once before in Arkham City, and from what I know, she has a disease that leaves her days numbered. Until Mr. Freeze decided to suspend her in cryogenic stasis in order to prolong her life long enough for him to find a cure for her disease. This is important as when we save Nora, she exits her cryogenic stasis and tells us that during her time as an ice cube, she was somewhat conscious. She spent years in her own thoughts essentially, and she could hear Freeze talking to her. I can only imagine how torturous this would have been. Mr. Freeze, upon finding out that Nora has thawed, kind of goes a little cuckoo, and we have to speed back to the iceberg in what is easily the coolest Batmobile set piece. After defeating some militia, Mr. Freeze and Nora come to terms with Nora's morality and decide to leave Gotham to spend their last moments together in peace. It was a really touching side story, and fun fact, if you save this mission for last, I mean like dead last, like Riddler trophies and all, you get a Gotham covered in snow. I won't get too far into it, but there are also a ton of new skins for Batman and his trusty tank, as well as a couple skins for the fellow Bat family members. Now, I can't necessarily comment on the design of the suits, as I think it all depends on what you like, but I can say that texture-wise, these all look spectacular, and there's enough variety that at least one skin will stand out to someone. There's also a massive number of challenge maps that are added to the game, but going through all of them would be a little redundant, so I'll just say that I found the settings and different aspects of the environments for these challenge maps, be that stealth, combat, or tank scenarios, were much better than that of the base game. The Batmobile races in particular were awesome for the visuals alone. I found the season of Infamy to easily be the best part about the season pass, but that doesn't mean the Arkham episodes were not good too. The Arkham episodes were a great way of structuring little bite-sized stories, and if we're being honest, getting the 2008 movie skin warranted another 100% playthrough on its own for me. I don't think Arkham Knight has the perfect DLC by any means, but I think it does a fantastic job of giving us more of what we loved about Arkham Knight, like the combat, stealth, and detective aspects while cutting down on the parts people didn't enjoy, like the Batmobile. So while it may not be the perfect DLC, I think it's well worth your money, time, and I think it's certainly a DLC done right. Hey guys, thanks for watching this uh, shorter video. I, as you know, if you've read my uh, community posts, I've had a lot of computer issues the past few days, so I figured I'd make a bit of a shorter video just to kind of tie you over until the, uh, the next uh, bigger one, I guess you could say. I'm working on a new video and I won't say what that uh, video is, but just uh, look forward to that. And then after that one, I'm gonna try and make a video on Assassin's Creed 2. So I just wanna, again, shout out our patrons, Ghostly Gaming, A Beat, Hutch Puppy, Lucas, Pyrite, Frank Riff, Howdy Partner, Ashwin, Denzel, Detective Pika, and Tyler. Thanks so much, guys. Like, I, I really, I really do appreciate it. And if you guys want to get access to videos early, some behind the scenes stuff, and some exclusive patron only streams, then uh, you can check out my Patreon down in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram at ThatBoyAqua, Twitter at ThatBoyAqua, and Twitch at ThatBoyAqua. Uh, we're doing a playthrough of Uncharted Lost Legacy right now, and it's going pretty well. And yeah, I just want to say that um, despite my computer spending a week in the computer store, I picked it up and within the same night, I realized it was running worse than ever, and uh, it crashed uh, the same way it was before. So they actually didn't fix anything. Uh, so I'm a little, not gonna lie, I'm a little pissed about that, but whatever, I'll figure it out. And yeah, I love you guys. I appreciate you all. And I will see you guys in the next video. Hopefully um, there won't be too many delays uh, computer-wise. So thank you. I'll see you guys later.